Okay, we are at the base of the Ferron Sandstone. Amazingly, there's no traffic right now, but you can see that marine shale, the kind of darker material grading up into the sand of the Deltaic Ferron. So what we're gonna do is work our way bottom to top. I did this once before with the Frontier Formation in Wyoming, and a lot of people like that video. Um, just looking at the facies, traces, and so on. So we're gonna do that here. There's three main bodies in the Ferron. Let's just call them parasequences. Easiest way to do that. If you just call it a parasequence, it means a body of sediment capped top and bottom by flooding surfaces. Whether they're abandonment surfaces or transgressive surfaces because of sea level rise or whatever, it doesn't matter. It's just a single unit capped by discrete flooding surfaces. So we're going to call them three parasequences. This is the lowermost one. We're going to walk through them, one, two, three, see what the similarities are, see what the differences are, and just make note of that, and then kind of summarize at the end. Sound like a plan? All right, starting our walk through, um, this is that offshore marine sediment. Uh, it's probably pro-deltaic at this point. So pro-delta just means the material that's getting blown out by the delta during flood. Because remember, deltas are fed by rivers, rivers are bimodal, so deltas are bimodal too, meaning there's flood stage when the sediment is delivered and there's fair weather stage when that sediment gets reworked by wave processes, tide processes, and so on. So when you see a bed of sediment that represents flood stage and sediment delivery followed by modification by marine processes. The pro delta is the mud that gets carried out further than the sand of the delta front. It's a lot of organic material. It's got maybe a lot of fresh water mixed in with it. Consequently, a lot of marine animals don't like to live in the Pro Delta because it's not friendly for them. Marine animals like marine water. Fresh water and terrestrial organics don't make them happy. So Pro Deltaic material usually does not have a lot of trace fossils. Open marine is usually chock full of them. So we can crack some open and take a look. I already have, trust me, there's not much in there. Look at this, here's our first sands of the proximal Pro Delta or more likely the distal Delta front. This is a lot like what we saw in the Frontier Formation in Wyoming. They're about the same age, by the way. Planar lamination, low angle lamination. Um, yeah, they're nothing you would call a hummock or a swale. This is not too dissimilar from the, some of the stuff you see on uh, delta fronts like the Panther Tongue or like what we saw in the Hatch Mesa. Problematic sands back there. And a lot of the time, this is just from um, you know, traction currents pushing that sand along, not strong enough to build ripples, or maybe too strong to build ripples, um, either upper or lower flow regime. So here's some sand. There are traces in here. There actually are. Uh, simple scolithos type burrows, vertical burrows, made by polychaete worms and, and bivalves and things like that. But there's not a lot of them, so there's not a lot of bioturbation. We can get an idea of what these sediments look like. Cleaner, very few traces. And then the mud representing fair weather deposition. So all is well, all is normal. And then another whoosh of sand came in during a storm on, on land. So think of these as like essentially hurricane deposits, you can think of them as. So you had a big hurricane, things went back to normal, you got mud. Had another hurricane, things got back to normal. So are we looking at annual or decadal? Your guess is as good as mine. Uh, who knows, Cretaceous climate was probably doing its own thing. But, you know, let's just say maybe decade more or so. So we are getting more sand, and then it kind of switches back to muds and silts. Ah, look at this. That's a talus chunk. That is pretty well burrowed. There's a whole lot of stuff in there. It looks like Paleophycus, Plymolites, maybe even some thalassinoides, the bigger burrows. Um, that's all fancy ways of saying horizontal and vertical burrows, probably made by shrimp and worms. Um, if you really want to get nitty gritty, you get some samples of this and clean it up. Wow, okay, yeah, look at this. This is very, very bioturbated. This stuff is chewed up. There's a lot of burrowing here. The original bedding is not so visible. So in intervals where there's a lot of burrowing, a lot of times you see this, the bedding gets kind of hazy. It's been chewed up. You know, one of the questions I got asked a lot about when I was working in the oil industry 
uh, looking at core or outcrop or description of rock. Engineers and petroleum geologists are always concerned, is borrowing going to enhance or destroy reservoir properties and permeability and porosity? And the answer is it can do both. It depends on your situation. That's true of so many things in life. It just depends. In a situation like this, where you've got mud, sand, mud, sand, it might actually be enhancing porosity and permeability because these muds might have been barriers to fluid flow. This is true of water too, or gas, or whatever you're talking about, carbon sequestration. These might have been barriers, but by chewing, up, chewing it up and introducing sand, you're homogenizing it. You might be actually allowing fluid passage between the beds and making less of a, of a baffle or a barrier for any kind of fluid, whether it's um, CO2 or water, or oil, or gas. The flip side to that is if there's enough clay and mud in there that it's screwing things up, you might be taking the good sand and churning it up with muds and clays and destroying the porosity and permeability. Depends on your fluid viscosity, it depends on a whole variety of things. We don't need to get into that right now. Ah, look at this though. Here's a thicker sand bed that's got some cross bedding in it. Again, not hummocky or swaley. This stuff is traction currents, but it's high angle. So it's very high angle, heading off um, roughly to the east, maybe slightly northeast. Yeah, some of this maybe does look hummocky and swaley. Um, you kind of see an antiform here, typical of a hummock. There's a tiny little ophiomorpha there. That's made by shrimp, acid shrimp. They like well oxygenated sandy substrates. So we might have uh, some storm wave influence. If this is hummocky and swaley, I'll do another video on that specifically because hummocky and swaley is possibly the most controversial sedimentary structures ever. Um, that's a whole topic for another video. I will make one. Let's just say this might be hummocky and swaley. So we might be seeing a storm wave um, interaction with the bottom. Again, we're still walking up through this first parasequence. So we're hitting storm wave. If that's hummocky and swaley and if that's storm wave base, generally, generally, you can always find exceptions. Generally, you're talking about 15, 20 meters of water depth. It could be deeper because it depends on the size of the storm waves themselves. Um, wavelength of the storm wave, divide that by two, that gives you the depth of reach of hummocky and swaley. So if you've got a 100 meter long wavelength, you can reach down 50 meters and influence the bottom and have hummocky and swaley bedding. Here's some burrows in the hummocky and swaley beds. Check that out. Little worm and shrimp burrows. Little small, small. Looks like Ophiomorpha in the sand. You know, if it's Ophiomorpha, it's made by Calian acid shrimp. Uh, there's some vertical burrows too, maybe vertical escape burrows. Um, so there's all kinds of little organisms. All right, and this is all burrowed up. This mud and silt is all burrowed up. So this is interesting. If there's a lot of burrowing and hummocky and swaley bedding, that suggests there's a lot of wave energy. So if you had a lot of freshwater stress coming into the system, like a river dominated or a tide dominated delta, you would have a lot fewer burrows, you would have a lot more traction currents, you wouldn't see things like hummock and swaley, and you wouldn't have it as bioturbated. So those two things are kind of working together and making me think, all right, we see some sort of wave influence on this lower parasequence. Storm waves, hey, look at this. Here's some more candidate hummock and swaley bedding. Um, so it's possible that this lower parasequence is a storm-dominated parasequence. Ha <laughs> ha! Holy cow, I gotta flip this for a second. Here's the surface of one of those sand beds and look at all the burrows. This is just crazy burrowing with Paleophycus and Thalassinoides. Simple burrows, but a lot of them. And that's pretty consistent with um, ample nutrients, a lot of oxygen, plenty of salty water for them. So this is the kind of stuff that's on the faces of the sandy beds. So they're pretty chewed up. Um, we're definitely getting more burrowing up here and seeing more evidence of storm waves. So I'm reasonably confident that this lower para sequence has a fair amount of storm wave influence on it. This uppermost amalgamated sand behind me, um, it looks like a combination of cross bedding maybe some trough cross bedding and possibly maybe some swaley and hummocky. Um, so that could be the equivalent of like a proximal um, shore face, which 
on a wave dominated delta would be like the proximal delta front. Um, you can call it upper shore face, you can call it proximal shore face, you can call it proximal delta front. There's a lot of reason to suspect these are genuine deltas with distributary channels. But so far, everything I'm seeing in this lower one is making me think it's a, if not wave dominated, heavily wave influenced, still wave influenced delta pair of sequence. So we're going to continue on and see what we see in the second one. So we're right at that transition from the lower one to the second one. And you can see it's mostly covered in talus. So that's not great. Um, I'm going to walk away a little bit up here, see if we can maybe find something that's a little less talus covered. It's grungy. It's really grungy. But let's take a look. All right, here it is, the second pair of sequins up close and personal. Wow, there's no doubt why it's grungy looking when you get a close look at it. The outcrop crumbles, it's a mess. It's because it is about 100% bioturbated. It is just chewed beyond all reason by big burrows about the size of my finger called thalassinoides. There's something called paleophycus, which is just a, a horizontal burrow lined with a mud lining. The last noise is made by a shrimp, ghost shrimp, the same things that make Ophiomorpha. This is like 100% chewed up. That's why this outcrop looks so grungy, because the original bedding is just destroyed. It's gone. These things have gone through it. Shrimp can burrow down three, four meters. So you're talking like what? 12, 13, 14 feet? So those shrimp could have been coming from up above, just chewing stuff up. And I say chewing, I actually mean just disrupting by digging. The worms that make Paleophycus might have been actually chewing. So a combination of things are just absolutely destroying the bedding here. Is that good or bad for reservoir property? Again, it depends on a whole variety of issues that we don't have any information on. So your mileage might vary when you're pondering the degree of bioturbation in a deltaic succession. So again, is this delta lobe river, wave, or tide dominated or influenced? I'm gonna to lean towards wave. If it was river dominated or strongly river influenced, there'd be a lot more mud. Um, it would be a lot more regular bedded because that freshwater mud would really hinder burrowing. If it was tide influenced, I would expect to see some tidal faces in here, like bi-directional indicators, and more importantly, double mud drapes bundled up, um, you know, sigmoidal bedding, that sort of stuff. Instead, what I'm just seeing is a whole lot of burrowing with what looks like hummocky and swaley cross stratification above. So I'm going to go again with parasignals number two being strongly wave influenced, if not wave dominated. That leaves one more, and we're going to go take a look at the third parasequence and then summarize. I got a little hasty. I didn't make my way all the way up to the top of the second parasequence. It's really important you do that. It's really critical you look through the whole thing. Look what I'm seeing behind me. There's a whole lot of really interesting bedding. At first glance, you might say a hummocky or swaley. If you actually look at it, though, there's a bunch of deformations. So there's a lot of uh, what appears to be fluidization of the sediment below, causing that kind of sinuous wiggling um, in the bedding above. So let's go take a look closer and see what's actually going on. Okay, so I had a chance to kind of look at this stuff behind me. Um, I'm thinking that a lot of this is because of partial remobilization and dewatering of the sediment below it. To the south of us, in the San Rafael Swell area, the Ferran is really well known for having big growth faults associated with this dewatering and mobilization. I think this is a very, very small scale example of that, where you had some slipping and sliding and dewatering underneath the sand, which created the contortions of the sand above it. Um, you see this right now in a lot of modern deltas because the sediment gets dumped in so rapidly, there's a lot of water entrained with it. As that water escapes, the sediment kind of squishes and moves and remobilizes and creates these kind of, uh, if not full on faults, then a lot of um, uh, contortion and deformation. So I think that's what we're seeing here. It is in that massive upper part of the para sequence too. Again, a lot of sediment coming in and a lot of water at the same time. So it makes sense as that kind of settles out and compacts and, um, and water escapes, you kind of slip and slide around. This is really cool. This is a block of sand from up above. But look at what we have here. These are shell hash layers. So that's all bivalve shell, maybe some ammonite fragments lining up at the base of some sort of 
um, depositional succession. Storm beds often have shell lags like this. We find a lot of them in the Jurassic in Wyoming. They're called coquina. And it could be that this marks a big storm bed where the shells got mobilized off the shelf and trained with all the sand that's getting reworked and dumped off the nose of the delta to be caught on the delta front. Um, so these could be evidence of the storm beds that were probably associated with the hurricanes that were delivering the sand in the first place. So that's very cool. Invertebrate fossils as classed. And here finally is that uppermost parasequence set. There's a lower section that just like the ones below starts off heterolithic, mixed mud, silt, and sand beds, cleans upward, cleans upward, and then abruptly on the very cliff top, there's a big massive looking sand. Um, there's actually a fine green interval between those two. And you can see it's kind of a dark, possibly organic rich, but again, don't know about organics and color, um, but it's definitely a finer green gray. So it looks like a prograding, shoaling upward succession, with some sort of break at the top, and then a fairly massive looking body. I wonder if that's a distributary channel mouth. Um, it looks a lot like a distributary channel bar. It very well could be. Uh, could be a mouth bar sitting on top of the delta front. We'll run over and take a look in a second. Okay, I made it across to look at Parasequence 3 in detail. The lower part of it's down there. We're at about the mid part. The upper part is still behind me. First thing I noticed is that some of these talus blocks, there's a lot of Ophiomorpha, uh, some big healthy ones. Now that doesn't necessarily tell you too much about the environment because down on the Texas Gulf Coast, I've got a lot of modern Ophiomorpha being made by Calinacid shrimp on the Trinity Bay Head Delta, which is freshwater for a substantial part of the year. Um, I tell people that and a lot of people have a hard time believing it. I really need to write up that paper and get it out there because it's true. Um, but there's a lot of Ophiomorpha down here, big ones, medium ones. That's telling you that there's nutrients. It's telling you that there's oxygen. It may not be telling you much about water salinity, but it's telling you there's nutrients and oxygen aplenty. So that's good. Does it help us define what kind of delta this is? Not really. For that, we're going to have to take a closer look at the sedimentary structures. Okay, not sedimentary structures, but really nice plumose fractures in this stuff. Um, even I can appreciate fractures every so often. I'm not going to do it full time and I'm not going to do it for a living, but they're kind of cool. So this is very brittle material that's breaking off and creating those what's called plumose structures because it looks like little feathers. Um, it's obscuring a lot of my sedimentary structures. So I have to keep shnoring around and see what I see in the thicker sands anyway. The thinner stuff is heavily burrowed, heavily bioturbated, which suggests a lot of salt water. We'll keep checking the sands though. Just chewed, chewed, chewed. This is not typical of a river dominated delta. This is much more typical of a wave dominated, storm wave dominated delta. All totally chewed up. By Paleophycus, the Lacinoides, Ophiomorpha, um, the usual suspects in the Cretaceous Western Interior. Now, this is the lower part of Parasequence 3. This is the best exposure of it. It's not so green. Um, sand beds, about four, five, six inches thick. Um, not a lot of mud in between them. There's sand on sand on sand on sand. There's some stuff between them, but it's mostly silty sand. Uh, very sandy system. It's probably because the finer grain material is covered up by the talus. But even so, um, if it was a river dominated or tide dominated system, you expect a little bit more clay or mud or silt. At least I would, that's my bias here. So again, there's so much sand here, it's really feeling to me like a lot of that fine grain stuff got blown away, probably by wave action, which is consistent with an interpretation of wave dominated, or at least strongly wave influenced delta loam. So it seems like we're three for three here with these guys. We don't seem to have a tide dominated or a river dominated delta in the bunch. They all seem to have varying expressions of wave influence and wave domination. It's a thicker bed up here, it looks burrowed. I wanna go take a look at that. All right, so it's not actually burrowed. Um, it's actually these little potholes from the erosion, but it looks like a hummocky bed. So again, assuming for a second that we're, we're beyond is it hummocky or is it not hummocky, Let's just say it actually is hummocky cross stratification. These thick hummocky cross stratified beds are amalgamating, just stacking one on top of the other up. They seem to be doing the same thing below. 
that just says it's storm wave deposit stacking one on top of the other on top of the other with not a lot of fair weather material preserved between so i think to me my deduction based on the evidence that i'm seeing in these things is that these three pair sequences are all significantly storm wave influenced or even dominated now that we've walked through them i'm going to finish off look at the very tippy top of the third because you never know what you're going to miss it's a mess it's totally bioturbated original bedding if there's any is barely there what is there looks like not surprisingly hummocky or swaley but the rest of it's just totally jacked by bioturbation um there's remnants of a pack rat nest over there doesn't do us any good it's just kind of interesting so unfortunately i wasn't able to get to that uppermost mass of sand which may or may not be a mouth bar um with enough time i probably could but i'm kind of running a long time i got some stuff i gotta get to great excuse for not wanting to climb up there um, but we made it all the way through the top of para sequence three before it gets to that finer grain material that then has the questionable mouth bar so all three of them bottom to top i would argue um look like storm influence deltas putting them all together in a depositional model that's telling you that condition stayed fairly constant throughout accumulation of the fair information here the ferron in other parts of utah looks a lot different than this uh, so there's growth faults like i mentioned down south is varying degrees of tide and river domination these particular outcrops look wave dominated doesn't mean the whole ferret is and if you don't believe me well take a look at any coastline map of any continent in the world and you'll see you can have storm and tide and wave dominated features right next to each other uh, there's a lot of systems that you'll see in Africa, like in Mozambique, there's systems in South America, and even in the U.S. Gulf Coast. We've got the Colorado, Brazos, and Trinity rivers all side by side, and all have very different expressions of the coastline. So that was our visit to the Farron outcrops here in Utah on the Book Cliffs. Again, there's a lot more we could do. There's a lot more outcrops we could take you to and show you around. But there's only so much time, and I'm just one guy with a camera. So until next time, I'm going to encourage you to get out and look at as many rocks as you can. Stay safe around highways. Touch rocks. Taste rocks. Chew on rocks to see what the grain size is. You'll be glad you did. And once again, thank you for watching. And I'll see you next time.